How are you doing tonight? Hi, Jack. Hi, Jack. Wow, what a great turnout. Thank you, Thank you so much for joining us today on Thursday night. I can't really see anyone that. That might be a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, everybody enjoying the food out there? The greens, the coffee? Well, um, oh boy, you might not know us, but I'll see you because you're here. Uh, I'm Vika Slyan, I'm uh, the host of the Meadows and Podcast, and this is my amazing co host, Mr. Mike Ballian. Uh, we are excited to be doing our first panel discussion talk. Uh, we have been looking forward to doing something like this. Something like this. Yeah, for a long time. And uh, finally, when Gail uh, said that was going to be here, uh, we couldn't. It's all the opportunity. No, no. Um, before we begin, uh, I want to thank all the sponsors who helped us put this together. Uh, we are truly thankful, especially for the last minute. Um, uh, I want to thank Alexia. Alexia, where are you? Thank you so much. Um, Alpin from Nazarian Law. Yeah. 
Hopefully you can enjoy what we're going to present. So thank you so much for all that you know you came here. Um, so yeah, we're going to have a great conversation. Yeah. We're, we're going to take you guys all the way back about 12,000. That is from Sunik, from the early 1900s. Yeah. Uh, this was first part of the 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 first part uh, run with so much history, but messages. All right, so uh, we're gonna start. You ready? All right, let's uh, let's start. See, thank you. All right, all right, guys. So uh, those of you who watched our podcast, we you know obviously this is in front of you. <laughs> the live. The live so um, what we wanted to do today is kind of take you guys all the way back. So let's say what roughly about ten to twelve thousand years. We're going to be covering the, the, you know, call it the birth of civilization, exploring um, the cradle of civilization. So um, to 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 kind of begin, um, let's travel back in time. Twelve, ten to twelve thousand years. Um, can you tell us what led to the establishment of Civilization that far back. Absolutely. Uh, well, <laughs> as I as um, as many of you you would know that basically civilization began in in uh, Armenian Highland in Armenia. So it is a very important event that marked the beginning of not only Armenian civilization but more generally human civilization. So when we say uh, the beginning of civilization, we're not talking about just the beginning of the history of the Armenian people, our own people, but all of human civilization. Yeah. And when we, when we say civilization, I think we have to be pretty clear that uh, what we mean by that, uh, big, what we mean civilization. So obviously civilization in itself is the beginning of human civilization. And very briefly, before that, the human communities lived as uh, hunters and gatherers. So what that means is, is like early our early ancestors, they, they lived, they would hunt various animals, they would also collect various shrubs and things like that. And this is the way they actually lived for hundreds of thousands of years, because we know that you know, early modern humans, they have a history of few hundreds of years, thousands of years, yeah. right? And that period is known as the Old Stone Age or the Paleolithic. Yeah. So humans, early modern humans, they lived this lifestyle for hundreds of thousands of years, believe it or not. And at one point, they lived in caves. They, as I said, they lived as hunters and gatherers that would actually hunt. Uh, various, you know, animals. They would also do some fishing. They would also like collect different like shrubs and things like that. And they, they basically sustained them for a very long yeah. time. But at one point, around twelve thousand years ago, humans begin to very radically change their lifestyle. This is a period that is called as the Neolithic or New Stone Age. Mm -hmm. This is the time that they basically the first settled communities began to take shape in Armenian Highland, in Armenia, more specifically in southwestern portions of Armenia. And this is the time that the first communities, settled communities, began to take shape. So the humans 
They uh, basically changed their lifestyle from hunters and gatherers who lived mostly in caves to settled communities. And just a lot of the first that we know as the beginning of civilization, this is when it actually began. This is the beginning of architecture. This is the beginning of first settled communities. This is the beginning of even first uh, use of iron, uh, different like uh, metals, uh, various metals such as copper. And this is the transition time when uh, our ancestors transitioned from even from the use of this early stone uh, tools and weapons such as obsidian, which was a very important uh, volcanic glass that was used as tools and weapons, yeah. to even early use of copper. So this is a very important time when we have actually a number of first that we're going to talk about in very detail okay. what they are uh, big. So for hundreds of thousands of years, you had this the Paleolithic or the Old Stone Age and the beginning of civilization ushered in the Neolithic, which is the New Stone Age, which is marked by the first settled communities that began in Armenia, which had, which we're going to talk about in very detail, yeah. what those communities are, what was happening in those communities, and what first civilization meant back then, some 12,000 years ago. Yeah, we're, we're going back, what, about 10, 12,000 years, right? According to mainstream narratives and mainstream history, we understand that the Ice Age, more or less, started to thaw out, or the Earth started to thaw out around this time, right? Um, this is more or less right when this all began, correct? Absolutely. And what what kind of proofs, what kind of thing, what 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 caused the, during this time, during the thawing of this, to kind of, what happened to the Armenian Highlands for this to all start up, and where, where did it begin exactly? Absolutely, that's a great question. And if you permit me, Mike, I would, no. I want to, <laughs> I want to use some slides to actually illustrate my point. So what I say actually resonates with the visual uh, data that we have, if we yeah. for me. Uh, so I would. Uh, oh, Thanks. great, awesome. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. So we see the core area, Mike, of, of, of what I just described. So basically, this is southwestern Armenia, southwestern Armenian highland. Um, we see that basically an area extending from the Van, Lake Van, all the way to Urfa, and a little bit down to northern Mesopotamia, which historically was referred to also as Armenian Mesopotamia because it was part of the Armenian civilization. We see this is the core area that represents the early first human communities that actually settled down and began to develop a uh, human civilization. This is the core area, and by the way, if you notice, this map is in German because it was done by the German Archaeological Institute, which is the only uh, non-Turkish entity that is allowed by the Turkish government to do digs and do archaeology in what is today Turkey. So the German Archaeological Institute is behind all of the research that we're going to talk about, right? Okay. So what we actually say is not uh, my research, obviously, okay. is the research of the very important German Archaeological Institute, which in close collaboration with the Turkish government, with the Turkish uh, Ministry of Tourism yeah. and Ministry of Culture is doing these excavations in, in uh, this part of, in, in the part of the cradle of civilization. Okay. Um, by the way, I want to let everybody know, we will have a Q&A after we're done. Yeah. Uh, so if you guys have any questions for Dr. Gabriel feel free later on, uh, you can come up on the side, we should have Mike over there and you guys can ask any questions uh, pertaining to the topic. Um, uh, let's talk about set of life. Uh, what would you say would be the key features for this area? Great, absolutely. 
So as we can see, the, the number of early settlements, big, so Halan, Chemi, Cha Yunu, Chafer, Ufa, Nevali, Chori, Yobeki, Tepe, we're going to talk about all of these sites and uh, I want to make that point that, you know, we're using the Turkish names for this site because the, the, they correspond to the modern Turkish settlements that are nearby. So, these are sort of like uh, terms that were put into circulation, but obviously, unfortunately, we don't know the actual ancient names of these sites, which, which are not these names. So these are sort of relative to the archaeological yeah. sites that are nearby mm -hmm. and to the villages that are nearby. So please that, keep that in mind when we actually talk about the names. But to keep it academic and scientific, we have to use these names yeah. because they are the names that have been assigned by the German Archaeological Institute, by various academic, you know, uh, scholars that have been yeah. doing research here, the archaeologists, etc. So these are the early sites that we see, Rick. And coming back to your very important question, so when we say the beginning of human civilization, we have to understand it's based on two main tenets. One of them is farming when our ancestors began to actually domesticate wild plants and started to cro have crops as, as, as they had like wheat, barley and things like that planted into the soil as they settled into these first communities and they would have harvest. They would harvest wheat, they would harvest barley, they would have harvest different grains and so when we say settled civilization, this is what we, what we mean. One of the tenets is the domestication of earlier wild plants that was again began here. And of course, domestication of wild animals. So settled communities were based on two main tenets. Domestication of wild, previously wild animals such as uh, pigs, sheep, cattle, goats, and uh, we see here, for example, goats, it says 11,000 years. So this is the time that the goats were, wild goats were domesticated and became part of the households. Yeah. So goats, and then we see, for example, sheep, were, which were, again, early uh, animals that were domesticated. That was, again, 11,000 years ago. And then a little bit after that, 10,500 years ago, we see pigs that were also domesticated and cattle. So Horvath goes back 10,000 years <laughs> ago. Yeah, this is the time when it all began. And wait, if you see the dates that like has 9,000, uh, 9,600, 8,500, that was later that all of this domestication spread from Armenia, from Armenian Highland to the near, nearby regions, okay? But it began, as you can see, this is again by the German Archaeological Institute, their research, meticulous research, based, based on the finds that they found in the earlier site that we measured, such as Nevali Chori, Chayudu, Alan Chemi, Yoregi Tepe, exactly. So, we have to remember, when we say civilization, the two core pillars of civilization, early civilization, is domestication of plants, and domestication of wild animals, which became household animals. Yeah. So what were some of these settlements? Do we have any like specific um, archaeological digs or anything like this where those, let's say, specific settlements that we know of today or still talk about today? Absolutely. Right? Uh, as we saw, uh, Mike, basically in the earlier slide, and we'll have another map of yeah. the topic detail. Uh, for example, places like Halan, Chevi, mm -hmm. Nevali, Chori, Chayunu, these are very important centers because it is from here that we get this earliest evidence of domestication of animals and yeah. domestication of plants. And not only that, of course, we're talking about just that, but there are a lot of firsts that came out of there, including architecture, because this is the time that uh, our ancestors began building the world's first temples, temples, first house buildings, including just average buildings, I mean just dwellings for the human beings. This is where it all began. As I said earlier, prior to that, our ancestors 
live this cave life, so they were cave dwellers and hunters and gatherers. So this point, around 12,000, 11,000, 10,000, it's about 2,000 year gradual period, marks the time when our ancestors began to settle down in the settlements and they they developed a settled community of life, yeah. which, which as we know, as I said, is the beginning of human civilization. And that obviously probably spread all over the place. And it Not gradually that. spread Absolutely. to other parts, including Mesopotamia, the greater Near East, spread to Asia Minor, especially to places like Chakaluyuk, Ashi Luyuk, which is further west. It's, it's right there, when you, if you see that 8,500 yeah, the degree. So those settlements later on were offshoots of the core civilization, and we saw the map of the core civilization, which was in the southwest of Armenia, right? In places starting from the Ban Sea all the way down to Urfa, historic okay. Armenian uh, city of Urfa or Urha, uh, which is about a 200 kilometer span. I mean, if you look okay, at that's for the late area. one, it's a vast area. We saw the map, right? Yeah. Outlined by the German Archaeological Institute. Uh, yeah. So here are the, some of the sites like, that you were actually referring to. So we have to remember Halan Chedi, for example, in historic Armenia, is considered one of the oldest human inhabitations that we know. Of. It's about twelve thousand years from somewhere from eleven thousand five hundred to twelve thousand years from Halan Chedi and Chayunu, Nevalichori, Gobekli Tepe, and Karaman Tepe. Are some of this is the core area that we earlier saw in the map, and believe it or not, it forms part of one civilization mm -hmm. because the architectural and cultural artifacts that have, have been found from so, here show that it, it's one civilization, it's common civilization, yeah. and we'll we'll see a little bit later on why, you know, what is the evidence that actually shows that. But these are the early sites in the Chafer Hoyuk, Ashiki Hoyuk, and uh, Chanhasan, Chapal Hoyuk, and the others are later offshoots that basically also show that gradually this wave of civilization from the core area in Armenian Thailand spread further west to area that we know as Asia Minor. So this area is known as the Asia Minor Peninsula. Chagal Huyuk, Chan Hassan, Ashiki Huyuk, all of these sites are in the Asia Minor Peninsula. However, they're intimately connected with the core area. So there were actual people that actually, you know, moved further westward and actually took that civilization with them further west. Now, is, are there translated versions of these names in Armenia? Or is it, I know we're using the, you know, the, the Turkish uh, names, the Turkish names yeah. because... Uh, well, for example, uh, that's a very good question. This core area that has monumental architecture, which we're going to see in a little bit, the Turkish government has designated as uh, stone hills because they have these earliest temples, and we're going to talk more about those early temples. They design, designate them as stone hills or in Turkish Tashtepele, which means stone hills. All of this area, there are about 12 such important core sites that have this monumental architecture of the world's earliest temples, starting with Gebek in Tepe, which in our movie we call as Port Asar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They actually have designated as Tashtepele, but that's a designation given by the Turkish ministry, uh, cultural ministry to this area. And, you know, uh, that all of this actually shows that we're going to see evidence that it's the builders that built, for example, Port Asar or Gyobeki Tepe, the earliest temple, world's uh, oldest yeah. temple, which is some 12,000, 11,500 years old. And the nearby sites are intimately connected. The builders of Gyobeki Tepe later on built similar temples in the nearby areas such as Nevali Chori, such as Karaman Tepe, and a number of other sites. Okay. Well, um, since you're bringing this slide up, I wanted to ask you, you know, with recent archaeological uh, discoveries, uh, it's kind of changed the way we look at history. Um, what were some of the important 
archaeological finds that were unearthed from all these settlements. Can you talk about some of those key sites? Absolutely. Key so as I said, for example, this is Paraman Tepe, which is intimately connected, and we see uh, very early dwellings of our ancestors. So this is the early dwellings, and we have to remember that most of the uh, buildings were made out of stone slabs, and this is called a pre-pottery period. That is to say, generally, even uh, utensils, things like pots and stuff like that were built out of stone. So they would use the, this painstaking labor of making these tools and uh, you know household utensils out of stone. The pottery period also began by the same civilization, our civilization, but a little bit later. So this is called a pre-pottery period, when even utensils such as dishes and things like that were simply made out of stone. They weren't made out of clay pottery. They were just made out of stone. So this is actually remains of one of the oldest sites of Karaman Tepe, which is nearby, near Ufa, the historic city of Ufa. Again, intimately connected with Gyobeni uh, Tepe, or Ortasar, as we call it in Armenia. Uh, it, this is a, a sister site of Gyobeni Tepe. As I said, there are 12 such sites, monumental sites, which show these sacred architecture, earliest temples that we have. We're going to see images of those. So we see that it's one common civilization built by the same people for the same purpose. The same area. Same area. Are there, I want a follow-up question. Are there more that they're looking for, or do they conclude that these 12 are it from that time period? That's a great question. Right? Like, are they, are they actively looking for more? Is there more somewhere in the area that they're trying to unearth? That's, that's a really great question. And the reason I say it, because only, for example, if we take Karaman Tepe, mm -hmm. only 1% of the uh, archaeological, uh, archaeological dig in Karaman Tepe has been so far uncovered. 1%. Can wow. you imagine? So when they do red radio magnetic tests, which is basically like kind of like an X-ray yeah, of the land that, that they uh, have, uh, right? We have that technology now to do that. They see that there's so many layers, so much that hasn't been uncovered that a vast area includes, and so far only one percent has been uncovered. Only five percent of Yobeki Tepe or Wurtasar has been uncovered by our wow. colleagues. So can you imagine we're just learning what is there? The greatest discoveries are yet to be made, and it's going to take decades, if not to say a century or half yeah, a century, sure until the site is completely unearthed. And as I said, it, it was began by the German Archaeological Institute, and now kind of the Turkish government has taken over. So they're doing most of the things now because they realized how important of a site this is. Yeah. Uh, and so we're just learning more and more about this site. For example, when Klaus Schmidt, we're going to see his image of the German Archaeological Institute, just uncovered Yobeki Tepe in 1994, 1995. He began, he was thinking that it was like hunters and gatherers who might have just come together and built a site. But now, more recent archaeology shows that there were dwellings right next to the Obeki yeah. Tepe. So it was already a permanent settlement when settled life existed. So new evidence is coming out more and more, and we're learning about the site more and more. Now we definitely know that we have to forget the hunters and gatherers. It was actually the transition when the hunters and gatherers completely settled down in places like Yobekli Tepe, Devali Chori, Chayunu, Alan Chembi, etc. And they actually had those first communities. And as I said, agriculture was a core element of the settled life, and so was domestication of animals. So it was horticulture and agriculture, both. Which Stonehenge was built according to some of the findings over the what last you said they unearthed this around 94 right Tepe. stonehenge was built earlier way, way earlier than Tepe. Yeah. yes stonehenge um, is around 5,000 years old Tepe is around 12,000 years yeah. old yeah uh, um 
So the, it's technically considered, technically, um, I'm assuming by a lot of scholars, it's the oldest temple in the world. It like is. You earlier, it is. That's right? a, that's a um, carbon dated fact. <laughs> what, are, what are some of the things that they found? What are some of the symbols that they can find that ties ties some of these other locations into one another? You, you briefly touched on it. If you could elaborate on that a little absolutely. bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so this is again Karahan Tepe, we see these early settlements, you see stairs, you, you see the dwellings, uh, which is very important. And this is a more recent discovery that is still ongoing, uh, starting in the late 1990s, they uh, unearthed Karahan Tepe, and you know, the research is still going on. As I said, only 1% of Karahan, yeah. can you imagine, it's a vast area covering many acres, so it's gonna take them decades before we have conclusive uh, and very detailed information about the site. But already so far, what has been found is all pretty amazing in and of itself. And uh, uh, my, this is also very important. This is actually, again, Nevali Chori, another very important site. And we see the ground plan, the floor yeah. plan of how these dwellings look like. And we see a reconstruction of uh, how some of these dwellings look like. And as you can see, uh, not only they have like, like individual dwellings that people live, but they also have these grand halls, storage houses and things like that. So we already see a more complex architecture develop during this time. And this in and of itself is already a, a sign of a civilization that is gradually develop, developing hierarchies. So for example, this grand hall was a place, an important place where the community met and they perhaps discussed things and, 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 uh, and things like that. So this is actually uh, an important stage in having civilization develop further on into more complex hierarchical societies that we know later on that eventually develop into states, into city states. So these are the early phases of that when we see those hierarchies, when these communities, as you can see, already started to build this pretty amazing, very important uh, and complex architectural structures. This is Nevali Chori. And unfortunately, I want to mention that as well, Nevali Chori was flooded when the Turkish government built uh, a dam that basic, basically actually covered it. Uh, the Atatürk Dam, they built it. So what we see here, this was done in the 1990s. And today, this site, if you want to visit, for example, yeah. and see it, you, you cannot, unfortunately, because the waters of the dam, the Atatürk Dam, yeah. that was built, no, they didn't break, they oh. just built the dam later on, and now it's underwater. So oh, what we see wow. here is the evidence, and, and you know, the, the archaeologists really rushed to study the area as much as they could. Unfortunately, we cannot continue with the archaeological digs here because it's underwater now. It's a lot of yeah. And these are just other settlements. Just if you see how these early houses look like, uh, Mike, this is very important. And these, are, and these are like depictions based off of some of the, like the floor plans. That floor they plans, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yes, done mostly by the German archaeological Institute in the 1990s. And here is a more of a sort of like a 3D model that was reconstructed, again showing these early houses, which is quite important. This is again Nevali Chori. You say 3D, he gets excited. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because Alan Chimi and Nevali Chori, this is really the earliest, earliest sites of human civilization, as I said, in Armenian Highland. And we see the reconstruction here. This is just this another symbol. symbols, symbols, right? Symbols. Yeah. This is important. This was done by Klaus Schmidt, who, as I said, also uncovered the Ubiqui Tepe. This is his re reconstruction. This is called a totem pole, if you know what it is. So these are early sacred sort of like shrines and poles that were built. And as we can see, the, the, the eagle or the vulture, along with the humans, occupied an important place and we constantly see this imagery of the vulture and the eagle right and this symbolism obviously continued all the way to our own days and we actually even see it on our coat of arms yeah the yeah. eagle as the symbol of armenia the vulture you know it, it goes back way 12,000 years to this time 
And even we see the old, not, not even the coat of arms of Armenia, we see, for example, if you know the Arjuni coat of arms, mm -hmm. they have this depiction on the Church of the Holy Cross that you actually talked about on one of your podcasts. You see these eagles, you know, facing each yeah. other. It's actually on, on the Church of the Holy Cross. So do you see the continuation? Well, what was it about the eagle? Do, do we know what it, what it was about the eagle that we were so, uh, I guess, respectful towards it to have it to be on our, on our symbols and you know uh, yes. the coat of arms or is yeah. there anything specific about well, it? Well there are different right. interpretations that's a great question uh, Dave. there are different interpretations some say it's <coughs> ego has been always the symbol of freedom you know he, he, he's like the yeah. king of the sky right you yeah. know and the lion is the king of the land right yeah. that's why we have both animals on our coat of arms but uh, there are also scholars that think that it has more astral theological connotation so that, that the constellation of the Cygnus, which is a bird constellation, yeah. is also they associate it with it. So they think it's actually deeper. It has more of a sort of like astronomical, early astronomical connotation. Yeah. Because, you know, our ancestors also knew that they, they, they worshiped the sky. They, they had this connection with the sky and with, with, with you know, early astrology. Yeah. So they actually connected with the Cygnus, uh, so, uh, constellation of Cygnus. So speaking of that, I have a, I have a question, teacher. Um, that hole in the middle, would that possibly, I'm not, you know, I don't know if you would know anything about, would that possibly something that aligns with any celestial body? Yes, it All does. Right. Uh, it, it not only these holes, we'll see a little bit later on a slide with these uh, so holes right. drilled right. inside the huge pillars of Yobagi Tepe, Nevali uh, Chori, Karahan Tepe, etc. So, again, we don't know 100% what it means, there are different interpretations. Some people say that, you know, it is actually the point of the entry of the astral and, and, and the solar light. So that had like solar astral connotation, for example, in various equinoxes, right? The wind direct equinox, the solar equinox. There were certain rituals that were done in these early temples by the people who felt that they reconnected with the universe, with their ancestral spirits, with like with other spirits. So, so the temples were this point when the people felt, that the worshippers felt that they're reconnected with their ancestral spirits and with this cosmic energy. Yeah. This, this, is, this is how it is actually, you know, one of the explanations. We don't know 100%, but you know. I mean, it's good, it's yeah. good enough reason yes. to speculate. Yes. And this is another first, this is actually a full, feature about 12 to 11,000 year old sculpture of an early human that has been unearthed from nearby from Ufa because Ufa is this important key place. Most of the sites are centered around Ufa. Historically, it has been known as Arminia's Ufa. So this, this site, this, this has been from, found from, uh, from Ufa. And this is about two meters tall, the statue wow. of early wow. human being. Yes, it is now housed in the Ulfa Museum. This is the oldest depiction of a human being, about 12,000 years old, that has been from, found from an archaeological site near Ulfa, and is currently dis displayed in the Ulfa Museum. Or, uh, you know, two I, meters. Look I know, uh, two meters. Wow. It is two meters, yeah. This uh, is the earliest, like, fully carved, freestanding sculpture of a human being. Another first from this period. It's about, what, six feet? So it's about, about yeah, it's about, about yeah, yes, yes, about six feet tall, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they actually made it pretty much, you can say, yeah, like a life human life life human life 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 yeah. sculpture of a, of, a, of a human being. Here it is just uh, from the back and the front, just another depiction to give you a better view and idea of how it looks like. And that's, is that granite? It's actually limestone. It's, limestone. it's actually limestone. Because limestone but was ready to know if this is, area and yeah. it's more easily worked. Do we know if this is uh, kind of like a depiction of some like some kind of a, like a leader, like a king or a god? There, or that's a good question. There are different interpretations. Some believe it's just a human being. Some believe it might be a wounded human being, yeah. like a priest, high priest. Some believe more be, maybe of a deity. So there are different interpretations, okay. you know, but, you know, it's depicted as a human being and it doesn't have any supernatural well, features. 
some kind of a there's like something like a V neck, right? Some people, uh, some uh, scholars have interpreted it as a necklace. As a necklace, yeah. or some say maybe it's like an early shirt covering, and the V has been. It's open to debate yeah. and discussion. Nobody knows for sure. Okay. Here we actually see another early depiction of a uh, sculpture from this period. This is like a human being, which is quite interesting. He's flanked by two leopards. So this is from a site. Uh, nearby uh, Saibuch, so that is actually is uh, have this uh, carving, which is again very interesting carving that shows this early human being uh, or deity, perhaps yeah. as you pointed out, flanked by two leopards. Incidentally, again in medieval Armenian architecture, there are a lot of depictions. You have like a human and then is flanked by two leopards, two lions, two eagles. Yeah. So. Again, it goes back all the way to this period. You know, to pick some sort of hierarchy or something like this. Yes, you know. Just speculate. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's open for discussion what it means. But again, these are some of the earliest carvings of humans, earliest carvings of animals on these megaliths. Yeah. They're called megaliths because they're like mega uh, important stone structures. Uh, many of them we'll see are several tons. Uh, and they're pretty tall on, on these yeah. various temples. Here, okay, we actually came to the Gyobeki Tepe, or an Armenian, sometimes we refer to it as Port Asar. So, this was unearthed, as I said, by Klaus Schmidt of the German yeah. Archaeological Institute in the 1990s. This completely changed our understanding of early human civilization. So before this, people never thought that 12,000 years ago, human civilization existed as we know it. With the discovery of Hortas and Gyobeki Tepe, all of that changed. So all of these, I don't know, even like a PhD dissertation, et cetera, that were written before that, had to, you know, that, that's it, they were gone. We do it. You know, but unfortunately, a lot in the academia still haven't revised what they're yeah. presenting. I mean, that is what it is. It. But this changed all of this because it proved that as far as 12,000 years ago, our ancestors were able to build such monumental stru structures, such as Port Asar or Gilbeki Tepe. Yeah. And as we can see, can you imagine all of these stones, some of them weigh several tons, and they were actually brought here from a quarry nearby, and they were erected here, and we're gonna see they have amazing, amazing reliefs which were at this time 12,000 years ago have been masterfully done. It is just amazing. This is just like when in the 1990s the German Archaeological Institute opened it up. They just they were just amazed at the level of sophistication. So would you say this is about that five percent of unearthing? It is. It is. That's it. it. Is. That's it. So this you have is, another. I mean, uh, they, there are like eight such temple complexes yeah. so far they just unearthed only three of them wow. only three of them there are 18 others that are under underground waiting to be gradually discovered and you know hope i'm sure not hopefully i'm sure they're going to yield so many more fascinating discoveries that we, we can't even think about yeah. i mean they're going to be amazing this is all in the Armenian Highlands. Yes. Yeah. For example, in Chayunu, they discovered the earliest woven cloth out of linen in Chayunu, um, one of the settlements that we saw. How was that in preserved for that long? Yes. <laughs> in Chayunu, they discovered the oldest copper. When the, the from basically this is the transition when our ancestors started to use the first metal weapons and tools that laid led to the Copper Age. So from the Stone Age, eventually this led to the Copper Age, we know as the Calcolytic, we're, we're going to talk more about yeah. that. The earliest discovery was made in Chayunu. Can you imagine? This, those are, again, like the first that we have. Like, and there's amazing. so many firsts, so many now, firsts. Is, is Gobelki Tepe like the only megalithic structure that they found, or is there larger ones as well. Yes. Uh, well, as I said, Vic, uh, there are 12 more structures that have these 
megalithic structures and we know that the same people that built them also built those structures because the, the sort of the signature is the same, the same, same, is the same. same design. and a core feature of these megalithic first temples that we have are the T-shaped pillars. Okay. So as you can see, do you see the pillars, for example, the one yeah. on the right, it, it looks, uh, it has the form of a T-shape mm -hmm. and the scholars actually believe there's something sacred about this T-shape. If you see, it even has this early cruciform shape, cruciform, right? Yeah. So it's like, if you, if, you, if you don't consider the top part, the bottom yeah. part is like a horizontal and a vertical. So the unity of vertical and horizontal reality. Yeah. So some people, some scholars even suggested a unity of time and space. So the, 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 the crucifix itself, the axis, has a sacred meaning, and we see in, in the form of these T columns, which are fundamental to these early temples, which all of these rituals and everything began are, are here. And all of those sites that are new, like Biobeki uh, Tepe, as I said, 12 sites that, you know, uh, has been collectively assigned this name as Tesh Tepeler, yeah. the hill, stone hills by, by the Turkish government, uh, feature the same architecture. So they were made by the same builders using same sacred architecture. And, you know, scholars have said this is the beginning of not only first temples, but first religion. Wow. First religion. And what is fundamental is that religion binded together these earliest communities. So it was the, a binding instrument that brought together these hunters and gatherers into settled communities who, based on their spirituality and their religious values, they established this first communities. So we we have to put, we have to remember how important religion was and spirituality in binding these communities together. That's well, you, you also have to imagine back then, you know, there was no city lights. So when they looked at the sky, they saw the amazing stars, the, the show, the galore, you know. So obviously that makes sense that they had this spiritual connection with the cosmos, right? Um, but it's just, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. I mean, you, you see the deep, uh, wow. This is again, uh, top shot. this is just Bortasar uh, and Tepe from above. You can see this layout has a sacred meaning. And as I said, some have pointed out that it's connected to the astral sky, to early astrology. Yeah. So this is the beginning of when our ancestors actually realized that we're intimately part of the cosmos of the universe. Yeah. That, you know, this spiritual energy that came to, to, to them was an integral part. So they were deeply, deeply spiritual people. You know, from these early shamanic totemic traditions, we had developed this early religious binding thing. They understood that the power of life, intimate connection of life was intimately connected to the cosmos, to the universe. Yeah. They, they were deeply, deeply religious and spiritual people. Now, with everything that you're saying, they were deeply religious people. And I'm not speculating, I'm not refuting it whatsoever. They had to have found some sort of symbols, languages, something written somewhere on these grounds for them to be able to make those determinations, right? Absolutely. And also, possibly in the other locations, had to have similar languages, symbols, and whatnot that tied all this together for them to have that kind of a hypothesis. Absolutely, that's a great question, uh, Mike. And you actually uh, kind of like asked. Uh, it's asked like a question it statement. Around. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Sort of, yeah. And we're gonna we're gonna cover that. I just want to show that currently, Mike, uh, uh, this is uh, again, Yorbeki Tepe, recently, in order to protect it from the elements, uh, enclosure has been added. So those earlier were early built photos. Like a, like a yeah, has been, like a home right? has been built. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, this is the current stage. So the earlier photos were done earlier in the late 90s, early 2000s, and this is how it looks like now. So. Any one of you who ever has a chance to visit around Ufa, definitely visit the place. You can, as a visitor, you can go see it. They made this enclosure uh, to protect the site. Uh, and this is the location. You can see how close it is to Ufa. 
Gyobeki Tepe, it's very close, you know, uh, 20, 25 miles from Rupa, and it's on the, on the Syrian border again. And this is Klaus Schmidt, who actually uncovered the site, uh, discovered it in 1994 of the German Archaeological Institute. He actually unfortunately passed away in 2014, so the Turks kind of took over, and now they're doing most of the ex uh, excavations. But this is him, and you can see some of the also reliefs yeah. on the on the T-shaped uh, columns. Yeah. And you see like these wild boars and ducks, and what is amazing also these holes, drilled holes, which is quite amazing. We just talked about yeah. what was their specific meaning and their different, you know, speculations. What was their uh, symbolism and what meaning they had? It seems like a lot of animals, right? Yes. Yes, and humans portrayed with animals, so, you know, there's a lot of this interconnection that we are part of the natural world, yeah, and part of nature. our ancestors realized that and portrayed it as such. Here, this is quite amazing. As you can see, they even have these reliefs of these uh, animals, you know, if there has been different interpretation of what it is. Some say it's a leopard or something, but I just want to show the level of mastery of just carving this, can you see it's like almost a 3D image that has is basically like the animal is uh, like walking. It has been depicted as such that is basically walking on the pillar. It's been just like yeah, can you carved, imagine it is carved, carved, it carved on top yeah. of the pillar, yeah. right? This is very masterfully done. I mean, considering this was done some twelve thousand years ago, it's quite remarkable to be honest. Again, this is the same depiction, wow. if you can see, so it's really carved on top of the uh, pillar. And the pillar has been, you know, it, it's it just worked that it has this sort of like a 3D look to it, which is quite impressive if you think about it. Again, just more of the reliefs, reliefs on, the, uh, on these pillars, which are quite interesting. You know, mostly, as you pointed out, animals. Mm -hmm. Here again, a fox or some kind of an animal depicted on this pillar. And what is amazing, this is basically a reconstruction, uh, a modern reconstruction of how possibly Yobeki Tepe or Bordasar looked like. You can see the dwellings that adjoin the Bordasar complex. So, you know, people live, this was their temple, like an open uh, air temple which they worship, right? So, so you can. Uh, so this bit like they had the church yeah. next to their hometown and like their dwelling. So it was like they were, as I said, very religious, very spiritual people. And you see this reconstruction, the early dwellings there next to Yobekli Tepe and reconstruction of the of the temples, temple mounts. Here we see, and here, uh, Mike, this is actually coming to the question Symbols. that you were asking. So we 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 know that. Basically, pretty much at this time, there wasn't a writing culture, so this is a prehistoric period. Yeah. Usually, when when we say historic period, when we when <coughs> we mean the writing period when earliest cultures had a writing system, which starts about five to six thousand years ago, when we actually had the earliest written inscriptions. So this is the prehistoric period. However, what is quite interesting, you have these early symbols or pictographs or I don't know what you want to call that actually are portraying something, are telling us something. And we know that for example these symbols, the pictograph that we have on various you know mountains, on the rocks, uh, you know, are telling us something. So you kind of write that this early symbolic system, symbol writing system, the pictographs eventually led to early writing systems which in turn later evolved into the earliest you know cuneiform writing yeah. earliest alphabet writing so even the earliest alphabets that we have hail from these early symbolic so, so. writing systems yeah. that we can see at Portasar at Gyobeki Tempe if you can see I mean for example there's like a crescent like symbols there's a symbol that looks like the letter H, later Latin uh, letter H. And we can see even like the letters, as you can see even like, for example, capital I, W, and things like that. 
This, these are early symbols that eventually yeah. would evolve into the writing systems that we know. Obviously, they meant something, they were sacred symbols, but they haven't been deciphered so far. We don't know what our ancestors were trying to tell us by these symbols. A Here they of, are. A lot of animals. So. Yes. Here they are. This is again, this, these symbols, right? I mean, even our alphabet, if you, if you trace it, even our Armenian alphabet, if you trace it, its origins go back to these early writing systems. It evolved, it evolved, it evolved, and eventually became the yeah. alphabet that we, that we now have, the Marshall Ten alphabet. And you see these early, early, early pictographs, early hieroglyphs, early uh, writing, and you can see here the symbols. And as I talked about that, you also asked- uh, the, the, the temple. The temples, right? Yeah. This is not Yobeki Tepe, this is Nevali Chori. Unfortunately, right now it's underwater because of the Atatu Dam. Yeah, that's unfortunate. But as you can see, do you see the same T-shaped yeah. pillars? Yeah. Which have a sacred symbolism, oftentimes, there are two T-shaped pillars that are facing each other, which obviously has some symbolism, as you can see in the reconstruction. And adjoining nearby, there are also these T-shaped pillars that also connote something. So obviously this had a very deep symbolism, you know, the worshippers would come here, they would worship, and they would actually, you know, have these ceremonies here. Now, would you say this would be the first official temple since they discovered so many of them. Well, Gyobek, Karaman, Nevali, Chori are considered sister sites. Okay. So they're pretty much based and built around the same time. Arguably, arguably Gyobek Tepe is the oldest of is the old. oldest one. Karaman Tepe just was built around the same time, maybe a couple of hundred years later. And Nevali Chori was also built around that time. Oh. And as I said, there are 12 such sites that have these T-shaped pillars, which obviously tell us that were, they were built by the same builders. builders man. Yeah. Same builders, same civilization. 12 such Just like megalithic that. sites. It's amazing. And here, this is again from uh, Nevali Chori, we see these already human depictions. I mean, this is also quite impressive considering this statue was made around 12,000 years ago, 11,000 years ago by uh, our ancestors, you know, and they have depictions of this, uh, the, this statue. Uh, I mean, this was quite amazing considering the age, you know, the artist yeah. back then, 12,000 years 12, ago. 12,000 years. The sculptor, he made the statue. Can you imagine? I'm sure, he was famous. Yeah, and it looks pretty I mean, it's realistic, so relatively it. speaking. I yeah. mean, and you know, uh, it, it was so impressive that even the uh, Turkish government used it to promote these sites for the tourism industry. And this is what they do. But funny enough, they say Turkey cradle of civilization. <laughs> so you know, as we know, as we named our our. our Top today, Armenia, the cradle of civilization. But unfortunately, since you know it's controlled by Turkey today, they always present this as ancient Turkey, ancient Turkey, Turkey cradle of civilization. Or at best, they would even say Anatolia cradle of civilization. Oh, but yeah. as we talked so many times, this area was never part of Anatolia. Yeah. It's, 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 been, it's been time. just rewritten. The history has been rewritten. Now it's presented as Anatolia, unfortunately, by the Turkish government. And lo and behold, here's an example. This is actually a magazine cover from the Turkish uh, Ministry of Culture, which says, Neolithic in Turkey, which is the, the beginning of civilization, the cradle of civilization. And they present, for example, the, the sculpture head that I just showed yeah. on the cover of this magazine, you know, as, a, as, a, as an important find of depiction of early humans some 12,000 years ago. Now, are, are there, is there a group, or maybe in Armenia, I'm not sure, that is challenging these terms as far as them saying that, you know, Neolithic in Turkey. Uh, is there some kind of movement happening from the Armenian side, or even academia in Europe that has realized that this is Armenian Highlands, right? Well, uh, unfortunately, for example, like the German Archaeological Institute, they're very careful and they go along with the narrative because if they don't, 
the Turkish uh, Ministry of Culture will simply yeah. not let them yeah. continue with their excavations. So unfortunately, we, we can't expect much from the European side because they just want to do digs. Yeah. They just want to do digs. They're saying that, you know, we don't want to get involved in politics. Oh, we just want to yeah. do our digs. So we, we can't expect much from them. Uh, and from Armenian side, there have been some work, some uh, scholars, you yeah. know, have pointed this out, but I would say not enough. So we have to, you know, and, and hopefully part of our, you know, talk here is also part of yeah. that to illuminate all of this. So, uh, you know, some have, uh, research and some, you know, articles and work has been presented, but I would say much more need is needed yeah. to be done on our part. You know, usually during the live shows, we always say, remember, thank you for joining us, but I hear it's so quiet. Are you guys enjoying this so far? Press the button, press the button. <laughs> okay, this is just, again, the same relief. I just, you know, wanted to show a different depiction of it. And this is the Karahan Tepe. If you look really close, if you don't know, you might say this is Gyobek, yeah, right? Similar. Because yeah. it was um, built by the same builders, right? You see the sacred uh, circle, right? That has like the symbol of eternity because we know even our ancestors, they revered the circle as this content. Yeah. It doesn't mm -hmm. have a beginning or an end, right? In and of itself, it's sacred. So that's, it was done in this pattern and the T-shaped pillars which I said is early form of the cruciform, and I would even make the arm argument of early form of Bishapa parts. So later yes. Bishapa parts also, and even the later Armenian Hajj cards. Yes. So the tradition of Hajj cards or Bishapa cards, yeah. remember it goes to this T shape, yeah. T shape, which is a basically a cross, right? Yeah. Horizontal and vertical. The sacred unite, the two opposites unite. It's like yeah. time and space. But if it, this had a very deep symbolic connotation. I want to mention, uh, we did an amazing episode about Vishapa Kams. So if you guys get a chance, go back. It was last season, right? Yeah, yeah. season two. Um, it's fascinating. You guys should go watch that episode. I didn't even know about any of this stuff. I know. I mean, I know. So. This is again Karaman Tepe, which is an important site. This was found after uh, Gyobekli Tepe. And as I said, only 1% of this site, it's a huge site has been excavated. Yeah. So can you imagine what we see oh, here? There are maybe like 40, 50 such temples all around it that still are waiting to be uncovered from Earth. Wow. Again, this is just uh, oh, Karama Tepe. This is from nearby, so you can see these are just like, can you see even they, like the floor is the bedrock it's called terrazzo. So terrazzo yeah. is basically when they actually use, it's a painstaking uh, work that they actually, you know, uh, rock, uh, like flatten the bedrock to make it like it looks like it's like a floor. A slab, like a, like a slab, slab, like yeah. a smooth slab. This is painstaking it was done. So that was the floor of the, of the temple. I don't know if you have seen this before, I just want to ask. Have you guys seen all this stuff? No. 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 And the Karahan, for example, the Turk, Turks interpreted differently, but a lot of people have pointed out because our ancestors used it. Yeah. It's the card, the Armenian stone. And they know they know that the stone has the sacred symbolism. So even they named it Tashkepele, Stone Hills. But you know, our ancestors knew this, the Urfa Armenians that later for generations before the genocide. Comes from them, and now they say the Kurds say, it, you know, the Armenians obviously yeah. when they lived here. So the Karaman and the Karaun, things like that. We know that, you know, obviously we always built our temples out of stone, right? Of course. Because, yeah. you know, we even consider the stone as this divine spark, it's connected to the universe. So Karaman here, the interpretation as the, as the term given, connected with the black and etc. No, it, it's more archaic connected with the Armenian word card stone. Here we see again uh, Karahan Tepe, which is quite amazing. You have these pillars, which again have been just carved out of the bedrock. They weren't brought here for the place here. They were just carved out of all of this was carved out of the bedrock. Can you imagine the painstaking work that went into it? And what is amazing, like there's this face. 
some people, you know, say it's, 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 it's amazing this like interpretation. They have this face that actually was also carved out of bedrock. If you see the center, that's like a human face or a deity. We don't know what it is, you know, maybe perhaps a symbol of the creator. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just again one of the chambers of the Kara Mantepe, which is quite fascinating. This is again, as I said, all of these feet in around Ufa, a little bit south uh, east of uh, Gilbeki Tepe. If you have a chance, you can actually visit the site. I was about to ask, are these accessible to the public? They are. Yeah. They are. Or are yeah. they just strictly archaeological? They're, they're accessible. You know, they're accessible. Yeah. This is the reconstruction of Karaman Tepe, a more modern reconstruction. So when uh, it was functioning, you know, uh, as, as, a, as a temple, as an open air temple. So this is the place that, you know, our ancestors, was, you know, have these rituals in this temple. So this is the reconstruction of the Karaman Tepe. Or what so far has been uncovered, if you even see the hills in the back, all of this is part of this huge, vast, monumental area that houses more and more of these uncovered temple mounds, you know, in the back. So we're going to know more. So I don't know, maybe in a couple of years, we have to do another uh, more job, finds, yeah. more finds and present them. Because of civilization the work terms would actually not hinder, you know, the research that needs to be done here. And here we actually come to a very important point that you know, uh, the genetic and the comparative linguistic evidence also points out to the Armenian connection. And uh, before actually this slide, we have actually a video by two outstanding New Zealand comparative linguists, yeah. Quinton Atkinson and Russell Gray. So these two scholars are amazing. Uh, you know, they worked for many years at the Oxford University, leading, you know, biogeneticists. So they use genetics and comparative linguistics to point out, okay, at the end of the day, who were the people thousands and thousands of years ago that actually built all of this? Mm -hmm. So and they come, came up with eight, nine, even 10,000 year data that says that even back then, these people, in order to build these advanced structures, they needed to have communication skills. Mm -hmm. They needed to talk to each other. So that even back then, they were already using a common language, a common Indo-European language yeah. in the Indo-European homeland, which is Armenia. And the oldest language that was spoken then was Armenian. Wow. This was said by this leading New Zealander uh, linguist, Quinton Atkinson and Russell Gray. And believe it or not, uh, there's a German documentary that was done at the beginning of human civilization that actually interviewed these two scholars. Yeah. And they did the interview in English, but they later on dubbed it into German because the German, the documentary is in German. Mm -hmm. And then we came up, actually a friend of mine, Yelich and who came been up a, with, uh, yeah, yes, great, yes. Yeah, uh, he came up sure. with, uh, who was a guest at your show also, by the way. Yeah. Uh, people of art. People of art. Yeah. yeah. So he, he basically dubbed it into English. So I would ask if it's possible to see that, that short 30, 40 second segment when Quinton Atkinson himself is actually saying that Armenians from eight, nine thousand years ago in their own homeland, they began all of this. And Armenian is as old as eight, nine, nine thousand years old as the Indo-European homeland is in Armenia and it later on spread to other parts yeah. of the world. And the Neolithic revolution that we talked about, the New Stone Age revolution, also spread with, with these uh, uh, Armenians that actually spread. Yeah. Can we actually see that short segment if we may? Okay. Und wo haben diese Menschen gelebt? Darüber gibt es schon seit über 200 Jahren große Debatten. Einige sind der Ansicht, dass sie hier gelebt haben, in der Pontischen Steppe, vor etwa 6000 Jahren. Andere denken, dass sie vor über 9000 Jahren hier in Anatolien gelebt haben. 
Aber wir denken, dass genetische und linguistische Beweise es am wahrscheinlichsten machen, dass sie von hier stammen, aus dem östlichen, fruchtbaren Halbmond, vor ungefähr 8000 Jahren. Sie sagen also, dass unsere Sprachen aus dem heutigen Armenien stammen? Wir denken, der Ursprung liegt hier, in einem Gebiet südlich des Kaukasus, etwa in Ostanatolien, Armenien und vielleicht im Nordiran. Und das vor über 8000 Jahren. Also diese paneuropäische Sprache wurde hier gesprochen? Ja. Und hat sich dann über den Kontinent ausgebreitet und verändert? In drei Hauptrichtungen, nach Anatolien, hoch in die Pontische Steppe und bis nach Indien und in den Iran. Diese frühe gemeinsame Sprache, davon gehen Gray und seine Kollegen aus, hatte ihren Ursprung im heutigen Armenien, von wo sie sich in drei Hauptrichtungen verteilt hat. Westlich über Anatolien nach Europa, nördlich in die Pontische Steppe und östlich bis nach Indien. Western Europe, and another part, obviously, another wave 
through Central Asia and went to other parts of Asia in the East. This is again for David Rice's fundamental theory for he's a leading geneticist of, yeah. uh, of today, David Wright. And you get him on? <laughs> sure. I mean if you contact him, if you can arrange it, absolutely. Fair enough. And here, remember we talked about the domestication of animals? So not only comparative linguistics is evidence for the spread of civilization from Armenia to other parts of the world. Not only genetic evidence speaks of that, as I said, being comparative linguistics, but also evidence of domesticated animals. And we actually see this very important map. It shows uh, with the striped line the early core area when the animals were domesticated the sheep, the goats, the cattle, etc., and the pigs. And later they were spread to other parts of the world, and it actually shows the earliest evidence that we have that these animals show up in other parts of the world. As you can see in the south, and we see also through Asia Minor, to parts to the root of Balkans, to Europe, or later on, in the more uh, like later waves we see in uh, Europe. Yeah. So that, that was done gradually, slowly, over, over a matter of hundreds and hundreds of years. It spread, all these waves spread from Armenia to other parts of the world. Sometimes this is also called the milk revolution because this is the time when our ancestors also started using milk as you know, dairies. They started consuming dairies also uh, as part of their diet. Here, this is again, it shows the earliest layer, if you see 8,500 BC, so we have to, of course, obviously add 2,000 more years, right? That's going to be 10,500. And then the agricultural revolution, the Neolithic revolution spreads to other parts of the world. You see like 8,300, 8,000, 7,800, and as you go further and further west, you see that you know other dates for the spread of this civilization, or that is to say, uh, the spread of domestication of animals and wild plants. That is to say, agriculture. People began shifting from the hunters and gatherers to settled communities as agriculturalists and as horticulturalists. Yeah. So domestication of animals and wild plants. And that was, by the way, again, German archaeological history. Yeah. And this, again, uh, believe it or not, uh, uh, there are not only genetic uh, marks for human beings, but there are also genetics for animals and plants. They also have genetic right, yeah. traces. So a genetic tracing has been done of early plants, including wheat, early, including barley, including grain, other various types of grains. And they all led to Armenian islands. That is to say, when these plants were domesticated, wheat, barley, grains, it all, if you can see, leads to the Bon area, Bon Sea, approximately. And you can see that how it spread to other parts of the world. When they do the genetic tracing, that it's they see that the earliest samples come from Armenia of these wild plants. So the people actually carried even the seeds and planted them there. The settlers moved and the genetic evidence is not only human genetic evidence, but all the genetic evidence for the animals and the plants, yeah. which has also has been traced. That's it? That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. friends or family, I even have like UCLA classmates who came here, so thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> but, uh, if you guys have any questions, we have a microphone right there, so we have about like maybe 10 minutes. If any of you want to ask a question, you can come up to the mic right there, and uh, the spotlight's on here, so we got a question. The thing uh, that you show the early settlers or the early domestication of animals go back to Tepal and, and all those dwellings. 
Okay, you said, you mentioned uh, there has been a, a, a carbon C test now. Now, the carbon C test is 12,000 years of art, right? But, and, and as such, they are saying these places are, or, or they, are, they are concluding that the early civilization is 12,000 years. Well, there is a question here. What we saw, it takes, it takes probably several centuries, if not more, of a technology development to get it to that point. Now, we see a car today, we drive a car, and we look at the car a thousand years from now, we say that car is thousand, thousand years old and it was marked at such a date. But until it came to that point, nobody talks about that. What, what I'm trying to ask is that 12,000 years or 11,500 years of animal domestication, how many centuries, how many generations of uh, the so-called Neolithic people or paleolithic, late paleolithic people took them to get it to that point. So where is it? That's the end of it. So how many thousand years or how many centuries we go before that? If you can elaborate on that other issue. Yes, uh, thank you, Raj. That's a great question. Uh, well, you're uh, kind of right to uh, spot on that, you know, uh, the, the, the 12,000 years oftentimes that we refer to is sort of like, I wouldn't say it's final. Why do I say this? Because uh, as I said, if we only have just uncovered a tiny, tiny percent of, 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 of for example, Yoriki Tepe or even less Karaman Tepe, 1%, I mean, obviously what we say cannot be conclusive and final because Obviously, when we, like, for example, we uncovered the other 99% of Karan Tepe or other 95% of Yorbeki Tepe, then we can give a final uh, answer to the question that you're asking, uh, Raj. So I think you're making a good point. Is, is the 12,000 conclusive? I don't know, to be honest. I would say let's wait for the evidence to come in that we can conclusively say Maybe it's, you're absolutely right, maybe we should talk about like, I don't know, 14, 15,000 years old. But right now, you know, I want to keep it academic. I would not talk about more than yeah, you don't want to suggest. Yeah, I don't want to talk about more than 12,000 years. And, uh, there, uh, this is not me saying it, but this, this is saying that people who actually excavated it. And, you know, I actually agree with what they're saying, but you know, I absolutely, and I think even the people that are excavating it, so, they're saying it that, you know, wait, you know, this, we're just finding out yeah, more. I mean, so I could go back even further. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Sort of video found this place, yeah. what, 30 years ago? Yeah. Right. But let's not jump ahead of time. Let's not make claims that are not supported by academic and archaeological evidence. Yeah. Uh, this is what I would say. You know, okay. but that's a great point. Thank you, Raj. Um, Thank you for this. I have one question. Do we know uh, the DNA makeup of the people who live there? Uh, yes, that's a great question. That's a great question. Uh, we have remains of some of the people, and believe it or not, which is quite amazing. I didn't talk as much as I wanted to, but we actually know that a lot of the DNA does match with the modern Armenian population of Armenia. So there has been less, less Uh, oftentimes there have been other theories that were just simply thrown out there, the Balkan theory, the Armenians were supposedly invaders from the Balkans, but I'm sorry, the genetic evidence is completely contradicting what has been put out for many years, and unfortunately, even like in, in various like uh, university, that was being taught as Armenian history, the Balkan invasion theory, but our sort of genetic evidence simply overcome completely contradicts that, and it has debunked that, you know, as simply not founded in any sort of uh, grounded uh, scientific evidence that we have. Absolutely. Thank you for the Thank question. You. Go ahead, sir. Uh, well, good evening. My name is Alan Dishbikian. 
Uh, my great grandfather was Mufatsi himself. Oh, so it's very nice. I, <laughs> I envy you on stage right now doing this talk. Uh, I just wanted to mention something, which is uh, uh, it's nice that this talk is happening now, a month before, you know, April 24 and so on. And uh, it's nice also that. Sorry, I'm mentioning this. Stefan Martamian is here in the audience because that's how I found out. Party. <laughs> yes, you know he's one of but, but uh, he mentioned. My mom to do <laughs> Okay, very good. He, he always says, like, oh, but we focus too much on uh, the ground meds, uh, I don't know, Mr. Martins, but it's ISO region gun. Like, what are we doing today? Uh, but he also, <laughs> he also recommended coming. Right. So, and I just want to say it's not it's not either or. Like, oh, we shouldn't be focusing on the past and the about today. No, you can do both. And I think you guys are doing exactly that. <laughs> My question: What happened to these places? We know there was an earthquake a month or two ago in that area. So, uh, but these buildings are still standing. So, what can we? Get a gather from the fact that uh, this is an earthquake region, those buildings are still standing, but did anything ha happen that they were wiped out? That's my question. That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, well, interesting point. We don't know why, but since you mentioned it, some, uh, about 8, 000, uh, around eight, 9,000 years sure. ago, these sacred temples, most of them, by the same people, they were actually covered up. And they covered it up in dirt, the same creators of the temple, and they covered it up with stones, and they left it as such. That's why they have been preserved so well. Yeah. They were not just simply abandoned and then debris and things like that. They were protected. The people who actually built them, they specifically hid them and covered it up, and we don't know why. So that's how they were preserved, these, these yeah. early, and all of them. Part of them, they were the same thing. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And as far as the earthquake, uh, to be honest, I don't know, the Turks actually, I don't know what it was, but the Turks actually this year, they wanted to have a huge conference dealing with this Tashkepelat, the sacred 12 sites of these temples. Uh, but the earthquake actually in Ufa changed their plans, so they just canceled it for the next year. So I don't know, it's like, uh, uh, that this is all I can add in terms of the earthquake. But luckily, the earthquake itself did not damage this megalithic site because you know they're so powerful. They're so yeah. you know these heavy stones yeah. built thousands of years ago. They actually withstood better these modern calamity of the earthquake than these modern so <laughs> This is uh, yeah. uh, good. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to thank Vic and Mike for adding so much to the discourse of Armenian historical importance to all the conversations. And Gebork, I can speak for all of us, I think, the contributions you have made. I have so much, so many questions as an architect and you know, construction management, but I, I just wanted to kind of start with um, in regards to the elevation of the Armenian highlands and with the understanding of Gobekli Tepe being buried on purpose, what, and, and you kind of answered this in terms of not speculating, but considering how much goes into construction and how much coordination it takes and considering how much these stones weigh and how much, how many people and agriculture and just food in general that would take to house these people to construct these structures. It would be an immense amount of people. And in regards to the younger Dryas impact theory, what are your speculations? I think that's all we can say for now. What are your speculations in where these people came from with the understanding of the elevation and the, yeah, that, that's one question. And the second question is, have there been any studies done on the mechanics 
and I guess the the making of the structure and the release themselves and the holes within the structures. Like we know in in Egypt, like the vases and, and most of the artifacts we have, there have been, you know, 3D scans of these structures and we can tell that they're, you know, like insane amount of precision. So have there been any studies done the structures and go back to the band other structures like that in terms of the mechanics. Great, great. Thank you so much. Those are great questions. Um, well, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think we did mention that definitely the changes in weather and also the climate of Armenian Island at that time, some 12,000 years ago, definitely facilitated the fact that why uh, civilization actually began where it began, you know. Sometimes I actually say that, you know, it's just, it's just facts, you know, it's just history. It's not that we're bragging about it. It's just some things actually led to that, you know. Obviously, we did mention that, that the last end of the last ice age led to that. Uh, as you rightly pointed, pointed out, the younger Dryas period that actually led to that. Uh, so definitely the changes in weather, the more mild weather actually helped to uh, bring about these changes and the cool climate of Armenian Island, which uh, I think at that time was even much more uh, sort of like uh, friendly to, to these developments to place. So it was even a milder climate that even we might consider is we have now in Armenian Island. It was a great sort of the, this period after the last great ice age some 12,000 years ago. So yes, I, I completely uh, believe that, you know, the climate had a huge uh, impact on why it began, where it began. Um, now, as far as uh, the other question uh, that, you know, ha ha some exam examination of these uh, mechanics of the building, building, you know, honestly, there are different like, theories of how it, it, it took place, on what labor, and how it was used. But one thing is sure, I mean, unfortunately, uh, in my opinion, there hasn't been any conclusive uh, answer to all of this. And I think, you know, we have to really review and kind of like uh, understand that these people, they might have used a more advanced technology than what we believe is often portrayed. So even the people who actually found the site, uh, they honestly don't know. You know, they just basically speculate and they offer these theories, but honestly nobody knows, even for example, how these huge megaton structures were erected. You have even some stones that were put on top of another stones. Those are like, I mean, it's very hard for primitive, quote unquote, human labor to actually carry that out with the tools and they supposedly say that they use obsidian or flint tools. I mean, honestly, that's not convincing. Uh, and the evidence that is coming of use of early copper, I'm honestly thinking that they actually developed, they deployed uh, advanced early metals such as copper, which as you know, copper ore is actually a not natural metal that was used in the erection of these temples. And we have like evidence in Nehali uh, Chori in Chayunu of use of early copper. So uh, I'm not I'm not convinced that they simply used the early stone tools, even obsidian or flint, to simply have all of this carved and built. You know, so uh, I would actually say yes, you have a point that we need more evidence. And again. I hope that once the sites are fully uncovered, we're going to have way more artifacts, way more evidence that we have now. I mean, come on, at the end of the day, we just have 5% now. Can you imagine what holds the other 95% that is still uh, under Earth? You know, there, there, we can, there can be all kinds of finds that, again, revolutionize our own understanding of how these sites work. Built. But one thing is certain that initially when they were saying they're just primitive hunters and gatherers, no, that theory is absolutely wrong. This was a civilization and relatively speaking, very advanced civilization. Very advanced civilization that we have. Uh, uh,
very much for this uh, great research work you presented. Uh, to question, you showed a two meter statue, and you said it's limestone. Uh, the megalithic structure stones were also limestone. Yes, they were. In the Bordasar? Yes. That's interesting. Yes. And how is your, I am aware that this is an academic uh, research work, but how is it related to our biblical Mount Hermon? As you mentioned, uh, uh, the coat of arms. I mean, coat of arms has also the biblical number. So, how is it related? Is there any connection here that maybe you can bring it together? Uh, sure. Well, as far as we mentioned biblical or Bible, if you permit me, I would just say not as much as we are, but interestingly enough, this point that you made by the person who actually uncovered the site, and this is a good question for me to reflect upon that. that uh, Carl Schmidt actually said that, you know, this is the original Garden of Eden. <laughs> so, he said that the ancients, they basically said that this is where humanity began in Armenia, Garden of Eden, the Adam, we say in Armenia. So, that memory survived and was passed down to Ufa, Haram, the sites were sacred sites. It was passed down from generation to generation because in the collective memory of the ancients, it was remembered that this is where human civilization began. And they simply referred to it as the story of Adam and Eve, yeah. the biblical story where humanity was began. But if you think about it, yes, humanity in terms of civilization actually is where this, all of this is began. So scientifically, this is the Garden of Eden. Of course, of course. So I would just say that in terms of the biblical question. Gentlemen, thank you for hosting this forum. Question to Dr. Nazaria, number one, thank you for your dedication to uh, Armenian studies and history. Uh, can you, as we know that there's things going on with questioning of territorial integrity of Armenia, can you speak to what thesis statements are being put out by our and academically and is that being done by academics in Armenia, diaspora, or hybrids who refute those revisionist histories? And what opportunities within the Armenian community we should be aware of to support that? And finally, I really look forward to more of these forums, Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, absolutely. Uh, as far as, you know, we just. Uh, as I said, you know, uh, very importantly, we have a very important evidence, genetic and comparative linguistics, that it wasn't just people, any people living here, but specifically it's linked to the Armenian people. And again, this is research by Quinton Atkinson, Russell Gray, David White. This is fundamental research. So I will just again to repeat what I said earlier, uh, on a, I, will, I will say that absolutely we have to point this out and you know uh, this is just scientific facts and these people clearly say that you know it's linked to uh, the people that actually lived there for thousands and thousands of years the native people and it is reflected as, as somebody rightly pointed out you know to, to, to the genetic evidence to comparative linguistic evidence and the archaeological evidence simply comes to also support that but, yeah. Mainly the, the genetic and comparative linguist, the linguistic evidence clearly shows the Armenian connection. And uh, obviously, like we talked about the, a little bit about the politics, you know, obviously the Turks and the, uh, for example, I don't know, like in, not here specifically, but those areas are also kind of falsifying and changing things on other areas. They obviously want to present it another way, but you know, we have to let the facts speak for, speak for themselves. You know, uh, that, that's what we have to do. We just have to know this. We have to present this to the world at large. You know, do more. You know, I hope what we're saying now, we have to constantly, constantly point yeah. this out, repeat it. This, this, is, this will reaffirm the simple scientific evidence that we have, you know? Yeah, very true, very true. Uh, sir, do you have a question? Hi. <laughs> Um, my question, I have two questions. First of all, uh, well, first, thanks for the great work, and uh, lots of uh, continue this awesome work you guys are doing. And um, my question is, 
do we have uh, tie-ins to a current historic, or not current, but later on Bronze Age, like Baroque period, the transition period from the prehistoric communalism that eventually went to the different uh, military um, militarization of the region to resist, let's say, the incursions of the Assyrians and Babylonians. This this transition from the communism, communal, the Nahalayan, the communalism, and then to the uh, other period of the militarization, the gradual transition with the um, artifacts. Is that being done? And second of all, um, do you um, work with any other historians in Armenia? Or have you, with regards to this, other experts? Like, uh, we lost a lot of people, like Amtak uh, Moisizan, uh, uh, and others in the field that we're familiar with their works. And is there anything being done for a more cohesive and um, uh, complete? Uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions. Uh, well, first of all, as I said, that's a great question because the next age that comes after the Neolithic or the New Stone Age, and uh, I want to briefly say that we say we call it the Stone Age because the people use stone tools and weapons. That's why it's called Stone Age. There was the Galilean, the old Stone Age. Those are Greek terms, right? Paleolithic was the old Stone Age, and the Neolithic, when civilization began, they started to use new stone tools such as obsidian and flint, etc. That you know, but there also is also the rise of civilization as we know it. That's why it's the Neolithic, uh, and the age that comes after it is the Chalcolithic or the Copper Age. So as I said, the roots of the Chalcolithic, which was before the Bronze Age, but after the Stone Age is actually again embedded in places like Chayunu, Nevali Choli, because the earliest copper tools and weapons that we find are actually in these places. So you're absolutely right that these early complex hierarchies of gradual segmentation and development of various strata in society begin in, in this time and also a very important usage of copper tools and weapons also begins at this time. So the early state formations that we have are from the copper age or from the Chalcolithic before the Bronze Age, which actually is again rooted in what we just talked about. Yeah. The origins are in this period. So the next stage was the Chalcolithic or the copper age, and after that, so the Copper Age, that's about 5,500 uh, BC to about 3,500 BC, okay? And then from about 3,500 to about 1,000 or 1,500 BC is the Bronze Age. And Bronze, as we know, is just basically a mixture of Copper and tin, which came up with, the mixture came up with the Bronze, right? It's a more evolved form of metallurgy. Okay, so uh, yes, the early state formations, and we're not going to talk about that today, but maybe that's not the time for that. We were all in the Yeah, that's not the time for early Armenian state formations. We're going to talk about them from the fourth and third millennium BC to about 1000 uh, BC. Uh, are rooted in what we just talked about, but we're going to talk about that later. And, you know, obviously, Kingdom of Ireland was very important. That's a topic for another time, for, of course. Uh, or uh, but yes, copper. Copper tools are important then for the Bronze Age, okay? So, earliest evidence of usage of copper comes from these early sites. Yeah. Early sites. And the, the other question, uh, Arda Kosita was a good friend of mine, a good colleague that actually is the one who encouraged me to. You know, continue all the way to my PhD. So he's a dear friend and colleague, unfortunately, right? We lost him in 2020 of all the things. But as you can see, his legacy and work continues uh, as what we're doing now. And I'm very close to him. And unfortunately, just a couple of days ago, uh, I lost another new friend, Mayor of Arnashis, actually mentioned, Garvin Mongia who was also a very 
very dear friend and devoted scholar. Unfortunately, people lost him just a couple of days ago. So obviously, you know, this work is kind of also dedicated to their legacy. And we're just going to continue. We have to continue. There's a lot of the work. Yeah. 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 Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for organizing this event. Uh, my first um, suggestion is I, I would like to ask you to continue this on and next time to bring up an issue of a very important issue of the subject, the falsification of Armenian history by certain people. Now we talked very little about it and we just went over it because the subject is something else. But I would really ask you to do that next time, talk in uh, depth and try to explain people why this is going on. Well, when it started in 1869, why it's going on until now, why this academia is fighting it like crazy, what you're talking about. So now, uh, what I would like to mention is about that um, relative stuff. Of course, it's my own personal opinion, but uh, since those people, when they built it, they had tremendous knowledge before they even picked up the hunger and just I mean, those guys knew a lot more than we can anticipate or imagine. Those are the same guys with the same technology as the pyramid builders in Egypt. Those are much more older than some people in academia would like to say. But these are 10, 20,000 years older than the moment it was, you know, uh, erected. So those people who came to erect these things, they had the knowledge already. So they just didn't go out of the caves and do that. And all these structures are uh, directed towards the universe. These are astronomical centers. These are observatories. They observe the universe. They equinox uh, the, the uh, precision of equinox. So they used it for a couple of thousand years until the time ran out and they didn't have a need for it. That's why they sealed it. And why they sealed it, my opinion, is very simple. It's a quick zone. Everybody knows that. And they knew it where they started erecting it, they knew it's gonna be an earthquake and it's gonna be destroyed. That's why according to my short mind, they simply preserved it for the following circle of 26,000 years later, and again it could become useful again. So that's my opinion again. It could be worth nothing, but just something to think about. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes. Again, common Indo European. We have, for example, the word Manu, Manu, 
the little man, right? So Mon or Mon, we have so like it, it has been suggested that when you say you know like the creator and the people uh, of the creator, you know, because you know at the end of the day our ancestors were view themselves as as, as, as as sort of like the people of, of the creator. So anything they would actually create would reflect the greater creator of the universe, of the world. So they were simply as a means or tools of this great creator. So it's, it has been suggested by scholars, by linguists, that this is what the name implies, Armin, Armin. Uh, which is again uh, linguistic uh, evidence and linguistic uh, strata that we have. So this is how it has been interpreted: the Armen and Arman. And as I said uh, later on in the written inscriptions, we come across these names, right? Ayasa, Armani, Arma, Armenu, etc. Uh, you know, it's a little bit later on. We didn't talk about this. That's the later. The Calculating, and especially the Bronze Age period, when you actually have the written descriptions, right? But uh, I think that's a that's a topic for another talk that hopefully we will have, and then we can discuss the early states, the names of these various names for our, for our country and our people, and then we can reflect more on that. That's for later. Yeah. Um, that's it. Oh, we have one more question. Oh. Um, question. Um, uh, yeah. It was a great pleasure to be here and to hear um, your talk. It's a great illumination and thanks for your work. Uh, just to uh, um, ask a, a suggestion at the same time. Uh, with the presentation of, uh, of the, all the names, with, Turkish names, German names, that's all um, in an academic uh, zona, uh, that's the work of being done. Um, my ask is please add also Armenian names because we have to know the original names of those places. As, a, um, as owners of that culture, because we are the owners of that culture we have to know and we think uh, we have to think about it because our language is our key it's the key of all the answers um, and we have to see that and to analyze that at the same time thank you thank you i'm completely agree with you uh, as i said for example for the sun we can use it and i think maybe we can at least we can actually translate and perhaps say, you know, this is what it means. So let, we have to remember that a lot of these names are not the actual Asian names that we have. Yeah. The Turks just came up. The Turks, so, yeah, yeah. At least we can, at least uh, maybe perhaps I was uh, actually thinking about that, that, you know, we had villages before the genocide. We can use actually the names of the nearby Armenian villages because those villages go back thousands and thousands of years. They have been wiped out, you know. That's why I actually made the point of pointing out that a lot of the sites, well, not all of them, but a lot of the sites are in and around Ufa. But for example, Alan Chen, Chayun, they're not nearby Ufa, they're more on the, for example, Chayun on the backs of the Euphrates. So, yes, it's, it's one thing that, you know, uh, I think on Armenian academia has to do more to sort of reconstruct. The Asian names and use their word, not just for Portasan, but for the other side. Because yes, for example, yeah. there are as many as 12 sites, 12 yeah. sites that have these sacred temples. We need yeah. to have, you know, specific. So thank you for that. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Um, hope you guys enjoyed this, and uh, we're definitely planning to do a lot more. And um, again, I want to thank all our sponsors for, for, for helping us out. We, we truly appreciate it. Show. Respect one another. Love one another.
special guest in the audience. Uh, he is the Los Angeles County Commissioner. He's the founding member of the Pasadena Genocide Memorial. Uh, he is the co-chair of the Mayor's Government Delegation to Armenia in 2017. Beloved and respected uh, community member, uh, David Gilbertian. David <laughs> It's, uh, it's an honor to be here on their behalf to 
make a couple of very special presentations. So if you'll give me just for one moment, um, we don't think we have enough Nazarians on stage, so we would like to actually ask one of our sponsors, Alpin Nazarian, to join me on the stage up here because I need a little bit of assistance. Uh, can I ask you to come join me, please? I'm going to have to ask that in order of protocol, I would kind of like to ask you to help me uh, to get one of those, those stacks of folders right there. The very first one on the left, that stack in blue, yes, please. And to present this together, I'm holding a special commendation from our Congresswoman Judy Chu, who represents the Pasadena area. And in honor of the wonderful work that Mick Engelsmith, that Mick and Mike have done, and also the incredible work that Dr. Nazarian has done throughout the years, we, uh, on, on behalf of Congresswoman Judy Chu, would like to present this proclamation to Georg Nazarian. And these are presented from as a certificate of congressional recognition to my body and Vic Aslan. Now I'm going to break the protocol here for a moment. These certificates of commendation are prepared by the mayor of Pasadena, Mayor Vic Gordo. And these are presented to Dr. Nazarian and to Vic and Mike. And I'm gonna read it very briefly. Vic Aslanian and Mike Gallian, Med Deosnit. We're providing education about Armenian American history, culture, and experience to increase cultural awareness and showcase the importance of Armenian American history. Best wishes for continued success. <laughs> on behalf of Mayor Victor Gordo and the Pasadena City Council for your dedicated work in the study of the relationship between Armenian and American history. Best wishes for continued success. These proclamations were prepared and to be presented on behalf of the Los Angeles County Assessor Jeffrey Prime whom I've had the honor of working as his deputy for a number of years in the, city, in the county of Los Angeles, representing all 88 cities throughout the county. This certificate is presented to Vic Aslanian, and this one to Mike Ballian for the mid Edelstead podcast. It is a county public service award, and in recognition of your work, Providing education about Armenian American history, culture, and experience. Your endeavor is valuable for increasing cultural awareness and showcasing the importance of Armenian American history as an integral part of our shared experience throughout the county of Los Angeles. On behalf of LA County Assessor Jeffrey Prime. That was a big one. So this is what we call a proclamation because it actually proclaims something. And I'm not going to go through reading all of the, the statements and the whereases, but this is presented on behalf of the County of Los Angeles Office of the Assessor, Assessor Jeffrey Prime for Dr. Gilbert Nazarian. <laughs> However, we have another wonderful surprise. Uh, we have with us a very, very special person uh, who is a mentor to a lot of us, uh, a activist at heart, someone who has uh, been an advocate and an activist for the Armenian cause for many, many years, and who has served 
uh, a significant part of the concentrated, focused Armenian-American community here in the United States, both as an elected city clerk and currently as the mayor of the city of Glendale. So with a very, very warm round of applause, please help me welcome that. Told me about this program, and when I heard it was my classmate from UCLA, I was hiring a doctor I was hiring. I had to come out and show my support. We had accommodations, but I think we weren't able to. Accommodations from Glendale are coming, right? They just, yes. just heard about being brought in, but I guess they didn't have living. Um, so you'll have special accommodations for small companies. So then we get to the golf for this All right. They're all going to say similar things, so we'll just read one and then pass out the rest. Sure. All right, here we go. Uh, this one is presented from Senator Anthony Portantino, good friend of the Armenian community. So we'll let the R So to, uh, to Dr. participation in this important event and the timeless efforts to educate the public about the foreign relationship between Armenia and the United States, as well as raise awareness of the horrific atrocities of the Armenian genocide, including the animal, best wishes, all your future endeavors. Signed, Senator Anthony Portman. So the only other thing I want to say is that, um, and this is I think particularly special to their work and me, is that uh, you know when we were at UCLA, UCLA has a phenomenal learning and studies program. Not a lot of people go into it because you know it seems that like as though to some that the pathways to uh, a successful and, and bountiful or uh, financially stable careers in our union academia are very limited, and you know it takes a very rare kind of individual to sacrifice. Um, certain successes and take the road less traveled by. I know this because I remember talking to Professor Richard Holanisian once and he asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be an Armenian studies professor like you. He said, well, you know, that's like a, a, a one-way ticket to the unemployment line because there aren't that many um, professorships. And that's on our community because we're not establishing those academic chairs of study that help people like them or do the research that they need to do to know where we are, where we came from, and where we're going. And why that's important is, as Vic stated, and as Mike has stated on their podcast, uh, how many of you, by a show of hands, have ever lost something? Or lost your way? Everyone has, I hope everyone has, right? And when you lose something, and this happened to me recently, one of the things that you do to try to figure out where something is, is what do you do? You, re re you retrace your steps, right? Where was it? What did I do? And what sequence did it happen? To try and figure out where something well, right now, the Armenian nation, the Armenian people, I feel, and some of you probably share this sentiment, we feel like we've lost our way. And if we're gonna find out where we are today and where we need to go, we first need to know where we've been. And so it's important for people like Edward Nazarian to feel the support of the community. Um, you know, there's more history out there than just what we were able to find on the internet. There are these things called books that we can actually read and look into. Um, but you know, as a community, we need to promote those folks who are involved in this. And with that, um, I just want to remember this evening someone very dear to us that we lost, a mentor to all, of many of us at UCLA, uh, Professor Gara Monja, who we lost, another great academic and historian. He was my Armenian language professor at UCLA when I came to UCLA, not really knowing how to speak, read, or write Armenian. And so, um, you know, in his memory, I know you're going to do him justice, Gabor. Absolutely. Thank you all for coming. God bless you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, before I I depart off the stage and and let the let the show go on, I want all of us with with great enthusiasm, please let's show our support to Mid Edelstein and the Doctor Nazarian with a very big round of applause. <laughs> and finally, we 
We are here to support this wonderful forum and we hope that it will continue. Um, but we also need to realize the real reason why we are all here. We are all here because we would like to be better equipped and better armed with the information that we need to defend and protect our identities. I am confident that this forum will serve its purpose. Thank you for all of you for being here tonight and thank you for this opportunity and being here as a guest. I am going to join our guests here and listen in amazement with everything that you guys have to present tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.